Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to the International Alliance for Phytobiomes Research webinar. Today, we are joined by Soledad Benitez Ponce from Ohio State University. Now, before we get to her presentation, I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about the Phytobiomes Alliance. So we are a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists, and anyone can become a member by being involved in different projects. Um, I want to thank our sponsors. That's another way you can become involved in the project is to sponsor our activities. And I want to give a shout out specifically today to Farm Box Foods, who's our newest uh, uh, sponsor. And really helps, will help us try to move more uh, decidedly through the controlled environment agricultural world. So phytobiomes, I know a lot of people think that we're just talking about plant microbiomes, but, but we're talking about a system. It is that complex system of plant-based agriculture. And that's uh, the idea of a plant in a soil or another substrate, uh, like as in hydroponics, uh, and microbiomes and arthropods and other animals and plants, as well as all the geophysical aspects, which would be, you know, weather and climate. And then all of that is impacted by, micro, uh, by management practices uh, that have happened throughout the course of, of the growing season. So here are just some examples of phytobiomes. This is a, a beautiful wheat field. Uh, a pasture, a vegetable garden, uh, a forest, a place in a forest is also a phytobiome, and grasslands are phytobiomes. In addition, controlled environment uh, situations are also uh, phytobiomes from whether it's greenhouse farming, vertical farming, hydroponics, container farming, or aquaponics. So all of these are phytobiomes and we need to understand what it, all the interactions that are occurring in these different uh, biomes to be able to have the most efficient sustainable production of our food feed and fiber. And our vision is that by 2050 all farmers will have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics based on the geophysical and biological conditions for determining the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field or a specific site in any given year or any given growing season. So our next uh, webinar uh, will be, uh, I've forgotten exactly the date, uh, 6th of July, uh, will be about the microbiome uh, of the rhizosphere and I encourage you to, to sign up for that. You can go ahead and register for it. And in fact, you can sign up to get information about our webinars as they occur and as we schedule them. So I just want to point out a couple of workshops that are going to be held this summer. Um, one, and this is, these are both being held at the International Congress of Plant Pathology in Lyon, France. Uh, the first one is Harnessing Culture Collections for Improved Plant Health. These are the microbial uh, collections that a research scientist may have, or maybe even a large collector may have. And then the uh, next one, uh, uh, an afternoon uh, workshop, is phytobiomes research for plant health, which will cover more aspects of phytobiomes. And you can register to receive uh, news about events that we are organizing uh, with this link. So just to remind you that this webinar is recorded and will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance YouTube channel later today. You can also subscribe to the, to the YouTube channel so that you never miss a new uh, upload of, of a new presentation. Please submit your questions in the Q&A panel and monitor the chat panel to see messages from the organizers. Uh, these might include links, direct links to uh, journal articles that have been referenced by Soledad. Uh, so you can always uh, 
just keep an eye on that on the side. And you can put your questions in the Q&A panel at any time, and then we will ask them at the end of the presentation. Already, you can download PDFs of the presentations in the handout panel. This would be my opening, which has the links for you, as well as the main presentation today. So I'd like to turn it over now to Soledad Benitez Pulse, who is an associate professor at The Ohio State University. And she's going to be talking today about drivers of microbial community composition in hydroponic leafy green production. So thank you for your participation and I will come back on at the end for questions. So Soledad, thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just had a scary message saying that my computer is gonna restart. Hopefully it does not do that, but I do have a laptop just in case, but I'm just gonna continue right now because nothing is happening. All no, right. One of those forest restarts. Oh, yeah. your fingers. Okay, okay. And can, I, can you see my slides, are they? Yes, we're good. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Kelly and the Phytobiomes Alliance for uh, inviting me to be part of this we webinar. Uh, welcome everybody here on the live webinar, as well as those that are gonna be watching later. Um, I'm happy to be presenting here about the work we're currently doing in the area of uh, controlled environment agriculture. So first of all, um, as Kelly indicated, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Plant Pathology at Ohio State University. Uh, my laboratory focuses on research uh, related to plant bacteriology and agriculture and microbiomes. Uh, today, our presentation is focused on the work we're doing in leafy green hydroponics, but we also do work uh, on other cropping systems, in particular corn and soybean production. Um, um, I'm going to start by acknowledging uh, some of the individuals and the funding sources that have been key for the research that I, I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, this include um, a, a group of um, collaborative Ohio hydroponic leafy green producers uh, who allowed us to um, work with them and visit their facilities and sample from their facilities. Uh, also, there's different members uh, from my lab whose work is gonna be acknowledged and shown later. Uh, a lot of this work is through collaboration with other uh, faculty and researchers at Ohio State University. And we do have, um, we have received special support uh, for bioinformatics and sequencing analysis uh, with Dr. Malacrina, as well as a different sequencing course here at Ohio State. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, most of the work that I'm going to be presenting here today has been funded through a USDA Agricultural Microbiome Program. Uh, and also I would like to thank the Ohio um, Center for Controlled Environment Agriculture. Okay, so let's get started. So um, Kelly, in her introduction, she was just talking about a controlled environment agriculture. So this is a great uh, sideway uh, to my talk today. Um, so controlled environment agriculture refers to uh, the production, agricultural production under uh, controlled environments. These environments could look very different. Here I have three examples uh, that we can find here in Ohio. Uh, we have a greenhouse production, we have container-based production, much of these containers just come as a pre-pack, uh, ready to go, a uh, facility to grow produce, but it also could be uh, indoors agriculture happening in, in urban environments. Uh, so controlled environment agriculture is characterized by um, several aspects, and many of these facilities uh, grow their plants in soilless substrates, so in the absence of soil. Um, most of the nutrients are then provided by a complex and synthetic nutrient solutions. And though there are other um, type of nutrient solutions that can be uh, used in CEA, I'm, I'm gonna be really focusing on a synthetic nutrient solutions for, for this talk. And in addition, in controlled environment agriculture, uh, as the name implies, there's different levels of environmental control with uh, some facilities having very high-tech, uh, light, uh, moisture, and temperature, and, and, uh, and readings, and with other facilities, uh, 
though they might have that a type of control, they might differ in, in their technology and size. Um, so within controlling environment agriculture, we have a hydroponics production and hydroponic production is, is a growing market. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, we're defining hydroponics as the growth of plants in the absence of a solid media. So plants are receiving all their nutrients uh, from a water-based uh, solution or a nutrient solution. Uh, both in the U.S. and worldwide, uh, the market of hydroponics has been expanding, uh, currently ranging between 10 to uh, 20, uh, currently around 10 billion dollars worldwide, uh, and with an increase, uh, expected increase of up to 20 percent in the market for uh, 2028. Um, Hydroponics is not a new technique. However, there has been a lot of interest in the recent years because it provides many uh, different benefits. For example, it provides access to a uh, local fresh, fresh food in uh, urban environments, as, as you can think of uh, based on some of the images that we saw in the previous slides. Uh, in addition, it can help maximize the use of, of land. Uh, instead of growing horizontally, uh, we can grow vertically and, and use land that way. Um, and in addition, uh, it could uh, in, there is evidence showing that yields can be greater uh, than uh, in soil uh, environments. Among uh, within the U.S., uh, most of the common uh, crops grown in hydroponics are shown in this top figure. Uh, we can see that after uh, tomatoes, leafy greens, uh, including lettuce here in this light blue and herbs here in this uh, purple color, uh, represent an important component of the hydroponic uh, market. So this is what motivates uh, our research given uh, the economical importance of both a CEA, a hydroponics, as well as a, a, a lettuce and other leafy greens. For a lettuce and other leafy greens in particular, a, we see that most of the production is done under two specific hydroponic types, a, which differ in how the nutrient solution is delivered and how the nutrient sol solution recirculates in the system. So here a, in the left, we have what's known as a deep water culture. A, in these systems, the nutrient solutions are a, are provided in a in a deep pond and the roots of the plants are completely uh, suspended and immersed uh, inside the solution plants are held floating on that super uh, on that nutrient solution uh, on different types of services often this is a styrofoam platform that just floats on on the liquid uh, in uh, industry uh, we tend to see that these ponds are a uh, big ponds made out of cement which are then covered with with liners and filled with these nutrient solutions which are then uh, managed to maximize crop growth uh, the other the second uh, most common type use hydroponic system type used for a uh, leafy green production is nutrient film technique in nutrient film technique uh, we see that uh, plants are grown within uh, these um, plastic containers and uh, these are a uh, most mostly made of pvc and these channels uh, are very thin channels through which uh, there is a constant flow of the nutrient solution so um, hence the name nutrient film technique what's happened is the very thin film of the nutrient solution flows at a constant rate through these channels and then the roots of the uh, lettuce in this case are directly exposed to the nutrient solution there there are though other uh, types of a uh, hydroponic systems that are used for leafy green growth uh, in this image here on the left uh, we see some of those examples as diagrams in the right panel you can see different uh, examples on production on production sites um, the main differences between the systems is how the nutrient is delivered if it and how it flows if it flows through gravity uh, on a vertical system or it flows uh, with a pond or it's um, or it's standing in a pond um, in addition, they might differ uh, in the level of aeration uh, that might be needed to uh, keep the, the the health of the roots. So all these 
uh, different types of hydroponics share the characteristics that they provide the nutrients to the plants through the nutrient solution. Uh, and these nutrient solutions have been designed to maximize plant growth. And this is something uh, very important uh, to highlight in this talk is that most of the research that has been done around hydroponic production using uh, synthetic uh, fer fertilizers have been focusing on the uh, on maximizing plant productivity. So uh, there is very little in terms of research in development of these nutrient solutions that has looked into uh, the, micro the microbial component of these hydroponic systems. So as we see here, there's just uh, four examples of uh, uh, different leafy greens and uh, the two main characteristics of nutrient solutions uh, that are managed uh, within a, a hydroponic setting. Uh, we have pH first and then electrical conductivity on, on, on the right. Electrical conductivity is an indication of the amounts of salts or ions present in the nutrient solution. And this is used to estimate how much nutrients are being applied uh, for growth of, of the individual crops. Um, so, you know, we know a lot about what are the uh, most, the proper and the most efficient and uh, nutrient solution conditions for plant growth. However, we know very little about how this nutrient solution and its management is influencing the communities of microbes present in the system. And as uh, Kelly uh, indicated at the beginning, uh, many of these agricultural systems uh, have these complex interactions between groups of organisms. So in our lab, what we're doing is we're really thinking about the whole phytobiome within hydroponic production. So this brings me uh, to the main research questions that we're currently working on in our lab around a uh, hydroponic leafy green uh, production. Uh, and we're really starting from, from basics uh, here. Uh, the first question, uh, is what are the roles of the microbial communities in these production sy systems, especially because all these nutrients have been developed to maximize plant growth. So what are microbes doing in the system? Are any of these microbes affecting plant growth in ways beyond just pathogens, right? So as we think of microorganisms in hydroponic production, we tend to think them in a, as important pathogens, either pathogens for the plants or potential foodborne pathogens for humans, uh, but also there could be other groups of microbes that could potentially be influencing growth uh, or it could be important uh, in how we apply microbial inoculants in the system. So the second uh, question that we're trying to address with our research is how we, can we increase the success of microbial inoculant in hydroponic production? From our conversations with growers, as well as from uh, other grower surveys in, by uh, other institutions, we know that microbial inoculant is a very important um, source of plant management, plant health management in hydroponic systems. Uh, we also know that there is a lot of variability uh, in, in many of the responses from uh, microbial inoculant use. So we also hope that by understanding uh, the types of microbes, and uh, the communities of these microbes and the interactions with the plant, we can provide some insight on uh, how this could be influencing the effect of any externally applied inoculant. Um, for the purpose of today's talk, I'm really gonna be focusing on the first big question, uh, really looking at what the roles of the microbial communities are. And like I said, starting from scratch, our first question is, what are the microbes that are present in conventional hydroponic facilities and how do these differ uh, and change in over time and space? Um, in this slide here, uh, I'm showing the pictures of the four members of my lab that have been highly involved in the research that I'm presenting to you today. Uh, I've uh, added a red a rectangle around Fiamma Guevara's uh, picture because uh, she's one of the PhD students in my lab. A, a great proportion of her of the data that I'm presenting today was generated by Fiamma. Uh, but we also have Leslie Taylor and Timothy Frey, research associates in my lab, and Gustavo Garay, a master students in my laboratory. Okay, so let's start looking at the data. Um, so we'll start with uh, what have we been doing in terms of understanding microbial community dynamics in commercial hydroponic facilities. 
Um, so in the beginning of the presentation, I thanked uh, the different growers that have collaborated with us. Um, so we collaborated with growers uh, from 10 different facilities across Ohio. Uh, one of the things that we noticed and you know, it's sort of indicated in these next four boxes is that there is a range of production characteristics within leafy green hydroponics uh, facilities range in size as well as production capacity. Uh, they uh, range in the type of system. Uh, remember that image that had you know the different system types. However, we see that there is a predominance of a uh, nutrient field te technique and deep water culture. But there's also uh, aspects of how the nutrient solution are managed that differ across facilities. So for example, uh, here I'm highlighting uh, the source of the water that is being used uh, to, to um, prepare the nutrient solutions, as well as uh, the nutrient solution conditions related to uh, nutrients, uh, electrical conductivity, and pH, which, as I mentioned earlier, are important for maximizing crop growth. Um, so we have a variety of facilities that we sample, and they uh, vary in how they are managed. So uh, what we did is we visited, uh, we contacted uh, the facilities and then we visited and then we developed the sampling strategy. So we tried to follow a similar sampling strategy uh, in all facilities. However, given the variability and the type and the setup of these facilities, there, there's some samples that you know, were not able to be taken in some and that we were able to take it in others. But we were really focused, focused on uh, taking samples a, on the a preparation stage, so before plants go into the hydroponic system, either the NFT channels or the pond, a seedlings are grown in growing a, in growing media. So you know we were starting to look at a, a subset of seedlings and the microbes within. Then we move into a, the actual hydroponic setup where we have either the NFT or the or the ponds. There we took samples of the original water. I, a, so you know we opened the tap and took a sample from from the water to look at the microbes that come in the input water into the system, and then we look at a, the microbes within the fertilizer solution. So once it's mixed with a water fertilizers. Um, the facility is using. Then we sampled uh, actual plants within the facility. Uh, again, the age of the plants that we try to do this as harvest is uh, some facilities sell their uh, products as heads, some facilities uh, sell their products as, uh, as leafy greens, so salad mixes. So this sort of influences a little bit our ability you know, to, to keep everything consistent across uh, ages. However, all samples were taken at harvest and harvest was defined by an individual facility. And then lastly, we also took samples of a nutrient solution at the end of, a, in particular, at the end of the NFT. So we, this is a recirculating system. Uh, the nutrient solution is, you know, prepared and there is a, an initial tank here. Then it flows through the system and it provides the nutrients to the plant and then it flows out of the system. So we also have samples from this uh, output of nutrient solution, which then goes recirculate and might go back to the system. And lastly, um, we were also interested in taking samples after harvest uh, and samples of services. So one of our collaborators, uh, some of our collaborators, Dr. Ilik and Dr. Uh, Ivy, they are food safety specialists. So we have some subset of samples that we're looking into a uh, surfaces with sort of more of a, a food safety mindset. So all these samples were collected from uh, different facilities. As I mentioned, some numbers might change uh, because of the characteristics of individual facilities. But uh, we have these three main sample types, uh, plant material, uh, water and nutrient solution, and then we have a surface a swabs. All these samples were brought into the laboratory where they were a process for DNA extraction and amplicon metabar coding. We use amplicon metabar coding as a high throughput sequencing technology 
to uh, profile the communities of bacteria and fungi in, in these samples. Uh, we use a specific ribosomal markers uh, for bacteria, in this case, uh, the 16 uh, the 16S ribosomal gene marker, and for fungi, we use uh, the ITS internal transcribed based region marker. Uh, once we have those samples ready, we submit this to sequencing. All of our samples uh, were sequenced uh, at a, a high depth using a Novasic Illumina technology. Uh, and then following uh, openly available uh, pipelines, we analyzed our sequence data, and then we summarized uh, the information on the communities of bacteria and fungi that we recover from all these different sample types. Um, for a subset of samples, in particularly those that come from uh, nutrient solutions, we uh, also uh, generated a culture collection. The goal to generate this culture collection is to then provide further analysis, uh, uh, perform further analysis on the genomic characteristics of some of these microbes present and uh, uh, generate some hypotheses about how genomic characteristics can contribute to potential adaptations to life in hydroponic systems, which are defined by these very high nutrient contents for a uh, plant growth. Um, so to the generate this uh, culture collection. We perform serial dilutions of nutrient solutions, plated these on, on a single R2A media, uh, and then we uh, pick single isolates, perform colony PCR, and we identify those isolates based on the full length gene of the 16S ribosomal gene. So we have a lot of data that we generated for over 700 samples from these different 10 facilities. Uh, so I'm gonna try to summarize some of the key uh, results uh, that we have. Okay, so um, the first take home message uh, that I want you to remember is that uh, bacterial and fungal communities differ between sample types, which is something uh, that is expected. We know that the communities of microbes that live in, in leaves and roots are going to be different from each other and they might be different from the suffering where they are living. So we, we confirm that. Um, in addition to that, we observe that system design and facility might also influence the characteristics of this community. So let me first walk you through uh, this image here. Uh, this is known as an ordination plot. In this ordination plot, we, uh, each data point represents a sample uh, for which we have generated a bacterial community. Um, samples, when closer to each other, it, it means they are more similar to each other based on the presence and the abundance or number of reads of individual microbes and samples farther away are more different from each other. In this figure, a green is data points, it represent leaves, red represent a nutrient solution samples and blue roots. So one of the things that we can see in this a figure here is that a, the samples from nutrient solutions are less variable across facilities than samples uh, from leaves and roots. So yes, we see there is this differentiation between these three different color types of samples, but we see that the red samples form a much closer knit, so they are more similar to each other, um, as, as shown with this, with this arrow. Something else, for example, that we see is, yes, we see differentiation between roots and leaves because we see that there are a different location, but we also tend to see within each sample type this cluster of samples, which might represent a differences between facilities. However, regardless of those differences of facilities, we still see there is a less variability within the communities of microbes present in the nutrient solution. Uh, we observed a similar pattern uh, for our fungal communities. So the previous slide was showing a, a summary of what we recover from uh, bacterial communities. This slide is a summary of what we recover from fungal communities. So for this, we use a different genetic marker. And again, we see um, this closer uh, need group of samples that come from filter A filter water and nutrient solution across the different systems. Um, okay, so we see differences in the composition of microbes. So the composition of microbes is um, 
partly a combination of the number of taxa, the, the name that they have, as well as a, how often they're present in the sample. So now we're going to look at a diversity of microbes, a, or what we know as a, sometimes we call alpha diversity, a, which refers to how many microbes are actually present in each sample, how many different types of microbes are present in the sample. Um, so again, um, in here in this image, I'm comparing uh, the different sample types, so filter water and nutrient solution, leaves and roots. Uh, on the top panel, I'm going to be showing bacteria. On the bottom panel, I'm going to be showing fungi. Here on the left, I'm um, showing a comparison between the total number of different bacteria or fungi present in each sample type. So this is just numbers. Um, so we see that overall in leaves there is a um, less amount of uh, types of bacteria in a sample, so less, less richness of bacteria or fungi in a sample compared to a uh, nutrient solution and roots. Um, and nutrient solution and roots do not necessarily differ from, from each other uh, for both bacteria and fungi. Uh, this figure in the right is another way in which we can think about uh, microbial communities in, in different types of samples, uh, which not only considers uh, how uh, many microbes are present in the sample, but are any of these microbes present in greater number? Are there uh, dominant groups of microbes? So, you know, if we had a, a perfectly even community, we will say that microbe A, B, and C, they all are present in the same abundance, so there's 10 of each. And we have a community, so that will be a more even community, which is the case here if for bacteria in the leaves, whereas a less even community we will have for a micro, we have a 10 of them, and then for the other ones we have two and two. So we have one microbe that dominates in the community. So then uh, that's when we get lower in the evenness scale. So we see that for bacteria, communities tend to be very even in the leaves compared to the uh, water and roots. However, that pattern differs uh, for fungi, especially when we compare uh, leaves to nutrient solution. So, you know, we see that uh, some of these patterns of diversity uh, not only are influenced by the type of sample, but also how a microbe respond to this type of sample might differ between bacteria and fungi because they have different uh, life history characteristics. Okay, so from this first part, um, what I've just shown you, just to quickly summarize, is that across 10 facilities, we observe that a, the a sample type or the bacterial habitat it drives community composition and diversity, and we see some variability in response to a system design and facility. But uh, in spite of this, we see that the communities from so nutrient solution are less variable overall. So then let's look a little bit more on uh, some of these communities and how they are uh, behaving in these systems. So um, when we look across the nutrient solution, uh, collected from different types of facilities or system designs. Here I have the water culture systems on the left, uh, nutrient field technique systems on the in middle, and then uh, everything else is clumped into the other category here. Uh, we see that um, there are certain groups of bacteria that are more consistently present in uh, deep water cultures versus NFT versus the other the other uh, groups of um, system designs. Uh, however, we also see that there is facility differentiation. So this set of samples most likely come from a different facility than this set of samples. But across all types, we do find a uh, certain groups of bacteria that are uh, really common in nutrient solution. Um, sorry, some of them have been underlined here in blue. And for some of these bacteria, we know uh, that they can be plant associated. Some of these bacteria, uh, we know that they might have uh, functions in nitrogen cycling. For some of these bacteria, we know that they are common in aqueous environments. And for others, we have very little information. Uh, however, across all these system types, we do find a consistent, consistent groups of bacteria. In addition to that, uh, when we look at our culture collection, we see that we were able to recover many of the bacteria that are 
that were present and recovered through our sequencing approach. So uh, the previous slide that I show you uh, was data from our sequencing approach where we uh, extracted the total DNA of the sample and we look at the bacteria without isolating them in, in culture. The data present that I'm showing in this slide is from the culture collection. So here we have uh, individual cultures for all these type of isolates. So, you know, again, um, one of the things uh, that we were able to do is to recover uh, many of the same bacteria uh, in our culture collection as present in the nutrient solution, and those are the ones that have the blue arrow. In addition to that, uh, from this data from the culture, culture collection, we can see that there are a, a small number of genera that were found across all system types. We also see that our genera that are uniquely uh, isolated from a deep water culture samples only, and then genera that were isolated from NFT samples only. So again, looking into more of the specific details of what are unique aspects of the microbial community present on these nutrient solutions across the different types of hydroponic systems. Um, so the next thing we look is now, you know, here we're looking at culture collections across all different types. The next slide is just showing culture collections within an NFT system. So as I was describing er in an earlier slide, in, in these NFT systems, we generally have a water source, and then the water source is mixed with the nutrients in a different tank. Then the nutrients flow through the channels and are provided by the plant, and then there is an output. Um, so one thing that we did in the NFT systems uh, is that uh, from we generated the culture collections from these different uh, points in the production, and then we we compared uh, the number and the uh, identity of the bacteria that were isolated from these different sampling points. So here, uh, each different color in the pie chart represents a different uh, genera of bacteria. So as you can see, uh, the, the colors across uh, the sim different sampling points uh, or physical sampling locations uh, differ in the composition of the microbes that are recovered. And we hypothesize that it is because as they are going through uh, the NFT system, they are exposed to the plant roots. And uh, we expect that the bacteria present in the nutrient output uh, are more uh, adapted to consuming uh, whatever root exudate or deposit there is from those plant roots. Um, and we can see that there are indeed different groups of bacteria uh, that were isolated from the system. Again, these are results uh, from all the different NFT facilities. However, when we look at individual N NFT facilities, uh, we have four different NFT facilities here. We see that um, we see a lot of variation in terms of uh, the amount of bacteria present in the nutrient solution across facilities. And in some cases, we see that um, there is not necessarily that expectation of higher uh, bacterial abundance in the nutrient output uh, compared to the nutrient input on water source. Again, this is uh, preliminary data uh, because this is all based on culture of all bacteria only. So we do need to recognize that we might be missing uh, many bacteria that uh, are not able to be cultured in the media that are, we're currently using. However, we are definitely learning a lot about the system and how uh, different uh, locations in the system might have a uh, unique ecologies that uh, will um, support different types of bacterial growth. Okay, so uh, to summarize what we have learned so far from uh, our uh, visits to different grower facilities and samplings, uh, we've observed that there's not only uh, less variability in the communities of nutrient solution across facilities, but we have identified certain groups of bacteria that are consistently recovered both through sequencing and culturing uh, from these facilities. And we also uh, 
were able to determine that the frequency of isolation of a specific bacterial group might depend on when they are located in the system. Um, many of these aspects have been described for soil systems, um, but uh, we still need to uh, better describe how this is happening in hydroponics. So for this um, first part uh, of the talk, there are next steps. Uh, we have to continue working on our data analysis and modeling of our uh, amplicon metabarcoding or bacterial community and fungal community data to uh, uh, determine more specific links uh, between system characteristics and members of the microbial community. And uh, we also have this very large uh, collection of isolates that are currently being characterized uh, for um, both a uh, functional aspects a uh, specifically related either to growth promotion or adaptations to live in an aqueous environment such as biofilm production uh, as well as their genome characteristics okay so um that was a sort of a summary and an overview of the type of research that we have been doing a uh, in, uh, on, on farm sites, on, on production facilities. Now we're gonna move into some other research that we have been doing in our research facilities here at, at OSU. So for this part, we're gonna be focusing on how characteristics of the nutrient solution might be influencing the composition of microbes in, in lettuce hydro hydroponics. So if you remember from uh, one of my earlier slides, uh, through our visits, and these different facilities, we saw that there were a range of conditions that were used uh, across across growers. So uh, in our experiments, we're really focusing on these three type of uh, nutrient solution parameters, uh, the source of water that's used to prepare it, the electrical conductivity at which is, it's kept during the production, as well as pH. Uh, for the purpose of today's talk, I'm really gonna focus on our experiments of EC and water source. Um, and uh, we had a uh, different treatments that are shown here. And for each one of these experiments, they were either performed in our uh, uh, deep water research systems where we have these uh, ponds that were uh, made and, and developed in collaboration with, with Crop King uh, here in Lora, Ohio. Uh, we have also uh, smaller deep water systems, with it, which is a, more of a bucket base uh, with aeration. And then we have also our research NFTs. From all these set of experiments, we are collecting a variety of data related to a lettuce productivity in green and microbial communities uh, shown in purple. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'm really gonna focus on aspects of the, the head biomass, which is really the, the yield and what is being sold, and then aspects of microbial communities uh, with some emphasis on the accumulation of microbes in different surfaces. Um, so just um, as the visual representation of some of the things that we're sampling, uh, when we're talking about microbial communities, we're also focused here on what is sort of shown in, in in different set of colors on the microbes that are surviving either on the surface of the roots, potentially forming a, a biofilm, or on the bottom surface of the ponds or the NFTs, again, potentially uh, forming a biofilm. So we are adding this additional sampling here uh, that we did not do uh, extensively with the growers on looking at um, how bacteria accumulate in surfaces uh, in, in this uh, research hydroponics. Okay, so let me show you a few data slides. And uh, so uh, the data slides that I'm gonna be showing are based on our experiments in deep water culture uh, experimental systems. And the first results I'm showing you is how a uh, management of uh, the EC of the nutrient solution influences a uh, not only the plant biomass, but also a bacterial and fungal community's composition. Um, as expected, uh, and based on recommendations of management, we know that uh, when EC is maintained as 1.8, 1, 1. that's when we uh, get the, the best um, lettuce growth. Um, 
So it was just good to repeat what has been uh, shown uh, before, but we compared those to two different nutrient types. So an, a lower EC is important to look at because then it, it could potentially be, mean a possibility of reducing the amount of nutrients therefore inputs that go into the production system. And a higher EC could also be interesting because then we just have more nutrients that could potentially be influencing growth of other organisms in the system. And so we observed, as expected, that biomass uh, uh, related growth is consistent at, at EC level of 1.8. And for bacterial um, or for the microbial communities, uh, for the purpose of this talk, and only uh, want to show you data about uh, bacteria that are residing on the surface of the roots. So if to generate this data, these roots were collected and they were. Um, Gent gently washed and then uh, they were subjected to sonication to dislodge any bacteria that was on the surface and those bacteria were then uh, cultured in, in media and then counted. Um, so again limitations of culture and technique however we see some interesting patterns and it is that uh, uh, even though non-significant uh, there is a consistent increase of uh, bacterial abundance in um, on the roots of lettuce that are grown under a, an EC of 2.5. So in order to try to understand what could be a driving a, these differences, we look at a few other parameters within the nutrient solutions in, in these systems. Uh, one of them, uh, well, first our question was, uh, going back to the, to the plant, is there just more root biomass uh, in, uh, in the 2.5 EC compared to the other um, to the other um, EC, EC levels. And then what we observe is that there's not necessarily a relationship between a root biomass and greater bacterial abundance because a, the root biomass under a 2.5 EC tends to be a lower than on 1.8. Then we also look at the presence of organic carbon in the nutrient solution. Um, and you know we observe there were no differences in the presence of, of organic carbon. We look at organic carbon because our hypothesis was uh, if there is a, these plants growing in the system, uh, then there's a more a plant exudates or plant deposition that then are going to be used the by the bacteria that are present in these um, in these environments. But we did not see a relationship between our uh, nutrients solution organic carbon and uh, the amount of bacteria present on the roots. Uh, interestingly though, what we did see is that um, in the EC 2.5, we don't only uh, have greater amount of bacteria that are growing on the surface of the roots, but greater amount of bacteria that are growing on the surface of the pond liner on the bottom of the water culture. Uh, what does this mean? We're not sure. These are just questions uh, that we want to continue to answer in terms of the relationship between uh, the biofilms in these different surfaces in hydroponics. Um, and then the last experiment that I'm going to talk about with sort of a similar story is the effect of the starting water source to prepare the nutrient solution on a um, both uh, lettuce biomass as well as a uh, mic microbial community. Uh, so for this experiment, we look into uh, three different uh, water sources. So we started by municipal water, which is just the water that we opened up here in, 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 our, in our unit. Uh, we also have a reverse osmosis system uh, in which the municipal water is treated with, and then we use that uh, reverse osmosis treated water in our systems. And then we collected uh, rainwater through rain barrels. And then we use this to prepare specific nutrient solutions and the same type of water we're using, we needed to uh, do any ad adjustments during the period of growth. Um, so in terms of uh, lettuce biomass, we see that there is a tendency of rainwater uh, resulting in a um, greater biomass growth than uh, when lettuce is grown in, in the water that's been treated by reverse osmosis. In terms of a uh, bacterial abundance, uh, we did not see a significant effect 
of any of the water sources on the recovery of bacteria from either the nutrient solution, as shown here in this red, or in the surface of the roots. Um, however, uh, we had the opportunity to do um, a sequencing experiment from a subset of samples here focusing on the municipal sample that has a tendency to be lower than uh, in abundance of bacteria than um, the rainwater. So if we ran this experiment twice, we and even though it's not significant, we do see this consistent tendency of a recovering less amount of bacteria from roots that were grown on municipal water compared from roots that were grown in the rainwater. And so since we observed this tendency, uh, we did a prelim preliminary sequencing run to look at the differences in microbial in bacterial diversity across uh, these samples. And again, what we're looking at is results of the bacteria here that are li living on the surface of the root uh, when grown into these different water types. So we see again consistently that there's a greater types of bacteria, greater diversity of bacteria on the surface of these roots uh, that were grown in rainwater compared to those that were uh, grown in municipal water. Um, and then when we look at a specific um, composition of these bacteria, we see there's you know there's a varying patterns. Of diversity here in these plots, each each color represents a different type of, of bacteria. Uh, I, we acknowledge here that uh, we realized that the chloroplasts were not removed from these samples, so you know you can remove. Uh, we had a lot of plant contamination. Uh, however, uh, when we look at the ten most abundant taxa on these uh, type of water systems, we see that the ten most abundant uh, differ between uh, types of water, and in blue, I have again highlighted uh, those bacteria that we do have represented in our culture collections and that we have uh, recovered from a uh, previous experiments uh, and observations in the, um, in the production systems. So to summarize, oh, sorry, I forgot that I had one more slide. Um, so going back, this data here, it was showing uh, that there's greater amount of bacteria uh, and more diverse bacteria recover from the surface of the of the latest roots, depending if it's grown on rainwater versus municipal water. And we've observed that same pattern as before, that uh, we also see the a greater accumulation of bacteria on the surface, on the bottom surface of the on the ponds, when we're uh, growing the plants in rainwater compared to the other types. So again, there there seems to be this relationship between the amount of bacteria present on the roots and the amount of bacteria present on on the on the bottom surface sort of accumulating on the on the on the bottom of of these deep water cultures so this is something we definitely uh, want to keep uh, looking into so just to summarize this and 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 uh, quickly to end in in this uh, set of experiments that i've described we observe the nutrient solutions characteristics influence not only the latest productivity, but also the recovery of the cultural bacteria from the different uh, sample surfaces. Uh, we also observed that there was higher abundance of cultural bacteria from uh, nutrient solutions with higher EC, as well as nutrient solutions uh, with rainwater. Um, and we also see this relationship between the accumulation of bacteria on roots and on on pond surfaces. There's a lot more that we that we need to do uh, with these experiments and this data. Uh, we have we're working on uh, the DNA-based amplicometer barcoding characterization of the communities of microbes in across all these experiments. But we also have a collection, a different collection of bacteria that comes specifically from uh, these uh, biofilms. Um, that we can try to study and, and try to determine their function as well as the relevance of biofilms in the system and if there is any connection uh, between uh, biofilms on the bottom surface versus biofilms on the roots. Um, with that, I will just bring you to this slide um, so you can read some of the summaries and then I'll be happy to open for questions. Thank you very much, Soledad. That was really very interesting and 
you know, it looks like you've got a lot of questions still to resolve over the uh, foreseeable future. And, but the work that you have done so far is really quite interesting. We have a lot of questions uh, that are coming in and we are not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we will try to get at, to as many as possible. But then Soledad actually agreed to uh, respond to the questions in writing uh, subsequently. And then we put those on along with the YouTube, uh, on the YouTube channel and on the Phytobiomes Alliance website. So, um, one question was, were all the plants at the same developmental stage when sampled? And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so for our facility experiment, no. <laughs> so the answer was no. And that is mainly because it's very difficult um, to control because each facility had a different target selling product. So some facilities sell their products as a head. Other facilities sell their product as a leafy green. So, um, and we couldn't know that until we really were there. So there was a difference in developmental stage. That said, my student, Fiamma Guevara, she had her own is seeds funding and she's running an experiment looking at how communities are changing over the growth of, of lettuce. So she's taking samples at different developmental stage. All right, great. <clears throat> in the PCA plots from the first section, were you able to disentangle what the axes were? It seems remarkable that the two sample groups are arranged perpendicular to one another and almost in line with the axes. Yes, and uh, one thing to mention is that um, because we're working with leaves, uh, we know we have to, um, the depth of sequencing is very different between leaves and roots because in leaves we get a lot of contamination from plants. So we had to remove a lot of reeds so one of the things that I think is influencing and, and why those acts look so different is uh, because this difference in, in depth of sequences. So as we move forward, we're really gonna uh, do our analysis separately for each type of sample, because we know that um, the amount of plants that contaminated our samples was different across all, all three environments. So uh, within that part of that is driven because these differences on, on sequencing depth due to chloroplasts. All right. Uh, were commercial inoculants used in any of these systems? And if so, were they detected by sequencing? So we have information um, on, you know, does the grower use um, inoculum? But uh, as the, based on the information that uh, we recover from the growers, uh, we do not necessarily have information if they were applied very recently. Um, so we do have the names, uh, so we could look back, but we could, we have not done that. Okay. <clears throat> have you looked into the microbial communities in organic versus conventional hydroponic systems? No, and that is very exciting topic. Um, so we do have a, have a collaborator here, Dr. Utara Samarakon. She works in, in, in ATI here at LSU. She's, she's running some experiments currently on, um, she's really more focused on production and vegetative growth. So that we have some possibilities there. And I know there's also a collaborator, um, um, Nate Hayden with Lebo. They are also running some experiments on, on uh, using organic software. So, but that's very interesting topic, but no, we have not done anything. All right. Um, did you do any groundwater checking? You know, you did the um, municipal plus the rainwater, but did you look at groundwater at all? We have not done groundwater. Okay. No. All right. How do you plan on studying the biofilms? So we have been doing a couple of things and we're sort of um, on method development. So one thing we're doing is first uh, we are using coupons that have different uh, types of surfaces. So we insert these coupons with the different surface characteristics in the bottom of, so here. So here, um, the way that we sample is because we have a coupon that we can recover at the end. So we recover that and then uh, for the CFU counts or for DNA analysis that we do is we use sterile sponges uh, to recover everything from them and then through centrifugation and sonication we recover the, the bacterial pellet. 
uh, but we're also looking into uh, doing some type of biomass biomass so we're uh, working on protocols to see total protein and my student uh, Gustavo in this case he also wants to look at uh, the prosodium salt as, as a marker of, of activity and we've also discussed qPCR um, but mm. as of now we've really been focused on CFU counts and DNA extraction from uh, what we scrape from coupons uh, that are growing that are inserted all right. Uh, so one question that we have is, and uh, it's a good one to kind of wrap up, is what is the final goal and purpose of knowing the microbial composition? What What is that ultimate vision about? Yeah, so um, for, for, for us, for our group, it is how we can use the information of the microbial community to better improve hydroponic production. So that, like from the perspective of my life is that how is this um, influencing a microbial inoculant of application? For example, um, you know, though we know if the microbial inoculant really needs to be on the roots or the microbial inoculant needs to go down in the biofilm and can it make a, still be successful for plant growth? That is one application. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration. So uh, we also have interest uh, with our food safety specialists in looking how these communities might or might not be suppressing potential foodborne pathogens as well as plant pathogens. So is, you know, by understanding these communities, can we build some type of a suppressive system uh, or by applying some of these microbes that were previously adapted to hydroponic and we suppress. So there's different ways in which we could approach the use of this information to help uh, promote growth and management of, of growth in hydroponic production. Could you just to follow on to, to that, is it possible that you could use this data to develop your own synthetic microbial communities to get the best of all worlds? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the big, the biggest question is what that study community will look like, and uh, you know, one of the questions we, uh, like a general biology question, is there a core microbiome in these systems? And based on the amount of variability that there is, it's very difficult to find that core of really. We have to have this key taxa. Um, so, yeah, but maybe we can come up with something that then we know can survive in the systems and can be applied. Right. Again, thank you very much, Soledad, for your uh, fabulous presentation. And uh, thanks everyone to who put questions in. We've got a lot of questions, and I apologize that we won't be able to get to all of them live, but they will be answered uh, and made available to you. So thank you for participating today, and we look forward to working in this new field. It's a uh, the Phytobiomes Alliance has a controlled environment agricultural working group, and we really are trying to address the kind of questions that have been raised today and questions that you've got in, in the uh, Q&A panel. So thank you for participating, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>